Data analysis from the Begisisa Center for Health Journalism has revealed that the number of HIV-positive South Africans over the age of 50 has more than doubled in the last decade, up from around 700,000 in 2015 to 1.85 million in 2025. They now form the second largest group of HIV-positive people in the country, up from being the smallest group 20 years ago. Let's take this up now with the editor-in-chief at the Begisisa Center, Mia Milan. Mia, thank you so much for making time to be on Full View. Uh, put these numbers in context for us. How should we be interpreting this data? So as you've mentioned, Tembekele, about a quarter of people who are HIV positive in South Africa today are 50 years and older. And if you want to get an idea, you've mentioned they're the second largest group of HIV positive people. The largest group is people between 25 and 49. And um, what is happening is the group of 50 plus is growing faster than other groups. And one of the biggest reasons why we have so many people of 50 years and older with HIV right now is because of treatment. We started our public health treatment program in 2004. So people who tested positive then and got treatment and used it correctly are likely still alive today. Research shows us today that if you use your HIV treatment every day as told, then your life expectancy is equal to someone without HIV mm. today. And that's why we have so many people but also a bit concerning there are still new infections also happening in the group of 50 plus. And do we have, I know HIV and AIDS data can sometimes be difficult to collect due to under testing in some regions, but do we have a sense in terms of a ratio of the two examples that you've cited, people who may have become infected in their younger years are now living longer because they are be able to take ARV treatment and indeed new infections. So we haven't specifically looked at those people, but I can tell you that we've got about 5.8 million people on antiretroviral treatment in South Africa of the 7.8 million people who are infected. And of the um, group that um, are on treatment, about uh, of the 5.8 million, about 1.6 million are 50 years and older. Now, we don't have specific figures as you referred to. They might be available, but I don't have them with me mm -hmm. as to who got infected when. But there's a wonderful um, model in South Africa called the Tembisa model, where we got a lot of our figures from that shows you who, you know, who was infected, in many years ago per year it, it shows you and it also shows you how the hiv pandemic is likely to look in the future and are hiv positive people in south africa Mia, you said they're living longer are they living healthier lives well you know that's where the warning comes in because when hiv pe positive people died early in their lives they never got old enough to get non-communicable diseases and those are diseases age-related diseases mostly like diabetes like heart disease like strokes that you get and they died before they got them now, non-communicable diseases are growing really fast among everyone in South Africa. And people with HIV now live long enough to also develop those diseases. Mm -hmm. So what we're dealing with right now is that people that we didn't have to deal with many years ago who had non-communicable diseases because they died are now also part of that growing group of non-communicable diseases. And that means that on top of receiving HIV care, because for non-communicable diseases, the treatment is normally lifelong because they're chronic diseases. So if you have diabetes, you can't stop taking your insulin. You have to take it for the, you know, for, 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 for the rest of your life. And if you have high blood pressure, you need to take those, those pills forever. And on top of HIV care, we now also need to look at non-communicable diseases, which adds an extra burden to the health system. And mm. some experts say, you know, there are specially trained nurses in our public health system who are trained, they call them NIMART nurses, to manage people, to give people ARVs and manage their treatment. And they say all NIMART nurses will now also have to be trained in treating non-communicable diseases. Right. And the other way around is also true. And I'm curious then, Mia, about the preparedness, the responsiveness, if you will, of the healthcare system to the emerging trends, the change that you've just been, you've just been telling us about, but also 
how hamstrung might the response be by the fact that as of the beginning of this year, we saw a number of programs affected by the United States government basically cancelling its funding for PEPFAR programs? It's a very important point that you raised, Demikili. And one of the biggest challenges we're going to face is we cannot address any disease or any condition or any pandemic without data. You need data to show you where's the gaps, where do you need to invest your resources in. And the largest proportion of type of health worker that those US government funded programs invested in is data capturers, not nurses and doctors, data capturers to see, to track who's staying on the ARVs, who, um, you know, got lost in the system, who do they need to go and look for, how many people have been tested for HIV. And we need a similar system for non-communicable diseases. But now with all these funding cuts, and we had 3,200 data capturers in our public health system funded by the US government, with those people people no longer in our system, it means that the priority to collect non-communicable diseases data will likely be low if we first need to fix, you know, f fixing HIV, collecting HIV data. And that will really ham be very hard for us to follow where the gaps are. We will have to find different ways to find that right. funding and perhaps also look at integration. Mia Milan, always good to talk to you. Mia is editor-in-chief at the Begisisa Centre for Health Journalism.